Developing right now on Morning News Now, pressure and pushback as Israel moves deeper into Gaza. This morning, Israeli defense forces denying allegations it attacked civilians during a raid on a hospital in the north. This as calls for a ceasefire grow over the IDF's killing of three Israeli hostages mistaken for threats. We are on in a war for our existence, and in this war, we have to continue until victory. Plus, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Israel this morning as the U.S. urges its ally to pull back. We have team coverage. Also this morning, a funding fight on Capitol Hill. Lawmakers delaying their holiday break to hammer out a deal on immigration. The latest on talks and how an agreement would impact future funding to Israel and Ukraine. Also, much of the East Coast drenched as a powerful storm system pounds several states. We're tracking the conditions and what you can expect as the work week begins. And calling all procrastinators. Time is running out to cross off your holiday shopping list. We'll get you some tips on how to do it without breaking the bank. Plus, if you're still looking for your perfect Christmas tree, might we suggest branching out, if you will. We'll go through the options from fresh cut to straight from a box and even some greener alternatives. I am the procrastinator who I'm needs not. the tips. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready to go. Opposite, yeah. uh, good morning. I'm Valerie Castro in for Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sowers. Thanks very much for being with us on this Monday. We're going to get started this morning with new details surrounding the death of three hostages held in Gaza. Israel says it's now investigating how the hostages were killed by defense forces. One of the hostages, 26-year-old Alon Lulu Shumrez, was buried over the weekend, prompting a new round of protests against the Israeli government. The families of the three hostages killed are also demanding Prime Minister Netanyahu resume negotiations with Hamas to release the remaining hostages in Gaza. This comes as the humanitarian crisis continues to worsen there. According to Gaza health officials, nearly 70 percent of people killed in the war are women and children. We have NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs standing by to give insight into what happens next in this war. But first, NBC News correspondent Hala Garani joins us from Tel Aviv with the latest on the ground. Hala, good morning. Thanks very much for being here. So let's start with the killing of those three hostages by the Israeli Defense Forces. What do we know at this point about what occurred? Well, over the last few days, there's been widespread consternation in this country as details of how these three men died have been confirmed by the Israeli military. They came out uh, with their hands up in Shajia. This is in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. You're seeing pictures there of the three men, including the, the uh, man who you mentioned there, Alan Simritz, who was buried over the weekend. They were waving a white flag. They were shirtless. Two of them were killed immediately. One of them managed to escape. Uh, and uh, there were cries for help heard in Hebrew, which should have been a signal to the Israeli military on the ground uh, that these could be hostages. Uh, despite that, uh, there was a burst of fire, according to an IDF official who was briefing reporters, and the third individual was killed. And there was a building nearby that was located on which inscriptions were help for, for help, I should say, were found. So there were several uh, really there clues that should have been uh, taken seriously by the troops on the ground. The IDF says that this was a violation of the rules of engagement, and there have been um, uh, reiterations now on the ground by some of the officials inside of the Gaza Strip to their troops saying that no one waving a flag, certainly no one waving a flag who is shirtless, should be shot at, should be targeted, and that includes any Palestinian coming out in surrender. Uh, Savannah and uh, Valerie, back to you. But uh, yes, you can imagine a lot of anger there among ordinary Israelis uh, at the uh, news here that's been confirmed by the military and the government of this accidental killing. Hala, given that anger, what kind of pressure are Israeli officials facing to resume hostage negotiations in light of these deaths? Is Prime Minister Netanyahu willing to return to the table and how is Hamas responding? Immense pressure. Uh, immense pressure on this prime minister. He's, he is very unpopular in this country. More than 80 percent, according to a poll from a few weeks ago, want him to step down. Though support for the war, it has to be reiterated, is still very high. Um, I spoke to a source close to the negotiations. They are staying quite mum, but they're saying we're closer to an outcome than just a few days ago, which is not saying much because there had been really almost a complete breakdown of talks. But we are hearing reports that 
that perhaps there's renewed momentum for talks. And we know, of course, that the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is on a visit. We expect him to address reporters a little bit later with the prime minister. So we'll bring you the latest on that as well. Also, oh, Hala, meanwhile, the United Nations is warning, continually warning about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, saying it is reaching a breaking point. Hospitals are now under siege as thousands look for medical treatment for injuries sustained during bombings. Also, we know disease is spreading. What are you hearing from the doctors working inside these hospitals? What is it like just on the ground there and to try to be helping other people? Well, the hospital system in the north has all but collapsed, and Palestinians on the ground are telling us that some hospitals have been surrounded and raided. They're pretty much um, not operational. In the south, there is a lot of pressure on the medical team, some of whom have relocated from the north to the south to try to treat people with injuries. We spoke, uh, the NBC News uh, crew on the ground spoke to one doctor in Rafa, and this is how she described her job of trying to tend to those with wounds and injuries on a daily basis. Just listen. The situation cannot even be described. Every second in this war is difficult. It's very difficult and, he and heavy on my heart. But when I have to deal with a child or a baby without um, uh, their family, without their father and mother, I feel heavy hearted and restricted. Well, this, uh, as we're hearing from the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, run by Hamas, that almost 19,000 Palestinians have died since October 7th. Back to you. Mm -hmm. All right, Hala, thank you very much for your reporting. Let's bring in Colonel Jack Jacobs for more. Colonel, good morning. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned a new phase is necessary in the war between Israel and Hamas. Here is some of what he had to say. There will be a transition to another phase of this war, one that is focused uh, in more precise ways on targeting the leadership and uh, on intelligence-driven operations that continues to deal with the, the ongoing threat that Hamas poses. Colonel, what do you make of those comments? Well, from the very beginning, it's been extremely difficult for the Israeli Defense Force to target the leadership because it was in difficult locations. The intelligence wasn't good, wasn't good from the very beginning. And quite frankly, it's not going to get a whole lot better unless there's a painstaking labor-intensive search on the ground, which takes a lot of time. This works to the tremendous disadvantage of the Israeli Defense Forces and Netanyahu's objective of getting the war over as quickly as possible. Uh, so they're mutually exclusive, but that's exactly what's going to have to happen if the IDF is go if it intends to eliminate the leadership of Hamas. Uh, and wants to minimize civilian casualties, it's going to have to take a lot more time. And politically, inside Israel, as well as outside Israel, Netanyahu does not have a lot of time, Valerie. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin traveled to the region over the weekend. He was there to reiterate the need to end ground hostilities immediately. What role can the U.S. play here to get Israel and Hamas back at that negotiation table? Well, uh, Austin's there to deliver a very pointed message, and it's probably going to be something like this. While the administration itself is strongly in favor of Israel's continuing the attacks to eliminate Hamas, it's imperative that civilian casualties be, be reduced uh, to the, as low as it possibly can be. That means that the use of explosive devices, whether they're dumb or smart bombs, has to be reduced. And in the end, the administration may not be able to control the funding for uh, Israel's offensive. That is, though the administration itself, the White House, Austin, may be strongly in favor of Israel's doing as much as it can to eliminate Hamas, the Congress, in the end, holds the purse strings. And Colonel, Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday he expects this war to last for months. How do you see it playing out in that time? Well, uh, you raise a significant issue. In the end, what happens in the end? Somebody has to administer Gaza. It's not going to be Israel. It doesn't want to do that, and nobody else wants Israel to do that. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is uh, the United States is strongly in favor of Palestinian Authority uh, 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 managing Gaza, but 
Israel says no. There's going to have to be some sort of compromise that's going to include the participation of a Arab countries in the region. Without that, this war will go on a long, long time, and nobody's in favor of that. All right. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thank you for your time. Well, this morning on Capitol Hill, top Senate negotiators are back at the bargaining table trying to reach an agreement on immigration laws. Over the weekend, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas joined lawmakers to iron out sticking points. Now, remember, though, this has implications greater than the southern border. Republicans say an immigration deal is essential to securing their votes to pass aid for Ukraine and Israel. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now on this. Hey, Julie, good morning. So where do negotiations stand at this point? What are some of these major sticking points. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, well, I was outside of the room all weekend where negotiators and senators, uh, James Langford, Kirsten Sinema, and Chris Murphy sat in a room with Secretary Mayorkas trying to come to some kind of agreement that they could move forward on a deal to secure our southern border, but also send aid overseas to Ukraine and to Israel. But there are still significant gaps. I'm told by sources in the room uh, that three main buckets, the two sides still have major differences on. And you see them on your screen. The first one, tightening parole authority. That means limiting who the Biden administration can admit into the country on temporarily humanitarian basis, also expanded detention of asylum seekers. This is something progressives in particular are strongly pushing back on, saying it's inhumane and cruel and expedited deportation of migrants, expanding that measure beyond the border and into other American cities like New York City and Chicago, which has seen a lot of migrants over the, month, uh, the last few months, especially with Republican governors sending migrants up. But bottom line here, Still a lot of work to be done, and they are set to meet again later today to try and hammer out some kind of framework their colleagues could potentially vote on. Is the Biden administration willing to make significant concessions here when it comes to the border in order to get the deal done, given that it's tied to that other aid funding for Ukraine and Israel? Savannah, they are willing to make significant concessions. They are going in the direction of Republicans, especially because they see what they're dealing with in the House. Conservatives who lead that chamber, uh, really a lot of them not in favor of even sending aid to Ukraine, but they do want to see the most conservative, the most Trump-like border policies. Of course, Democrats are not willing to go that far, but they are willing to go far enough, Savannah, that I am told that Hispanic lawmakers in a meeting with White House officials, including Secretary Mayorkas and Biden's chief of staff, uh, they were very frustrated in that meeting on Saturday because they do find these proposals to be cruel, to be untenable. They think they're being iced out of conversations uh, and that Republicans are getting far too much of what they want here. But still, uh, the Biden administration seems poised to want to get something done because they do recognize this is not only a problem at the border for the president, for Americans, but it is a political one, too. Julie, I know the Senate hopes to vote this week. Even if they have the votes to push it through, it still has to go through the House. I mean, what kind of time frame are we looking at here for this to even make it to President Biden's desk? Well, if the Senate did take it up this week, which really is a big if, that means the House is actually not going to come back until mid-January, and that's when they would take this proposal up. But realistically, Savannah, and just to be straight up with our viewers, I really just can't see that happening. It's too ambitious. Yesterday, the minority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, sent a note to colleagues telling them, listen, progress has been made, but we are not going to rush. We are not going to jam you to vote on something when there is still no legislative text. And again, no significant policy gaps still remain. So I can't see the Senate taking this up this week. We'll see if Leader Schumer still plans to put a bill on the floor without tax uh, to fund uh, Ukraine and Israel and, of course, to secure our southern border. But again, Republicans are really pushing for that vote to happen in January, and that sets up quite a busy timetable with also those two spending bills uh, up at the end of January and beginning of February as well. All right, Julie Serkin, thank you so much. Former President Trump is feeling the heat this morning following some anti-immigration remarks he made over the weekend. The Biden campaign accusing Trump of echoing remarks made by Adolf Hitler. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard has more. Former President Donald Trump rallying his supporters in the early voting state of Nevada. It comes a day after he made these controversial comments about immigrants at a rally in Durham, New Hampshire. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. The Biden campaign accusing Trump of parroting Adolf Hitler, as similar wording was used in his writings. And at least one of Trump's GOP rivals blasted him for the remark. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel 
absolutely under stress and strain from the economy. Trump is promising the largest deportation program in the nation's history if reelected in 2024 and requiring immigrants pass a strong ideological screening. Trump also touted his relationship with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, calling him, quote, very nice, and referencing Russian President Vladimir Putin. But even Vladimir Putin, has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? Of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. In new polling from CBS News out of New Hampshire, Nikki Haley climbing to a strong second position following the endorsement of the state's governor. But this is Trump this weekend, attracting the New England masses. Donald Trump loves our country. He loves us. We need a new birth of freedom. A stark contrast to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as he struggles to gain traction in the state. Vaughn Hilliard, NBC News. And there's people coming. And I. Well, saying on politics, NBC News has just launched a new series called The Deciders. We're taking a closer look at seven counties that could have a major impact on the 2024 election. This morning, we're focusing on Miami Dade County in Florida, which is home to a large Hispanic and Latino population. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra joins us now from Miami. Marissa, good morning. What is it about Miami Dade's demographics that make it such an important and unique county to watch? Hey guys, good morning. Well, where to start? I mean, Florida has the largest Latino electorate of all of the battleground states, and Miami-Dade County, where I am right now, also has the most registered Hispanic voters. I want to show you the breakdown of voters here in Miami-Dade County. These are the residents of Miami-Dade. You can see nearly 70% of them identify as Hispanic or Latino, and half of them are Cuban or identify as Cuban. And 66% report speaking Spanish at home primarily. I also want to point out that this is also home to the largest populations of, and I'm going to rattle off a lot of names here, Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, Argentinians, Chileans, Colombians, Peruvians, Uruguayans. So when we talk about the diversity here, uh, yes, nearly 70 percent of the people here in Miami-Dade County are Latino or Hispanic, but within that there is a lot of diversity in all of those countries, all of those cultures is going to really inform how they vote and is going to specifically inform how campaigns try to reach those populations populations here, guys. What can we learn from the country's voting trends in previous elections? How are they changing over time? What are you learning there in Miami? Yeah, and I want to show you the specific numbers that, that illustrate what I'm about to say here, which is that Republicans over the years consistently since 2012 have made significant wins and gains. So look at the difference there. I think most significant, uh, when you look at the difference in support for President Trump, for former President Trump, that leapt from 34 percent to 46 percent between 2016 and 2020. So it was during his presidency, during those first four years, that he really Really made a significant difference here and, and we can talk about the strategy in a little bit here but Republicans have not seen wins or gains in Miami-Dade County like this since 2002 guys so this was a significant wake-up call to Democrats who had previously seen Miami-Dade County as something that was a surefire win for them previously so given those trends and looking ahead to next year's election what can we expect strategy wise from both Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. in that county and how much of a priority is it expected to be for both of those parties. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly illustrate and, and describe to you what we've seen in previous years. I mean, Miami-Dade County has always been an important stop, uh, an important campaign stop for former presidents, for people on the campaign trail. I mean, we had the former president, Bill Clinton, former president, George W. Bush. And then, of course, most recently, we had former president Trump. He has made a point to make his presence and visibility known here in Miami-Dade County. I mean, look at this is footage from Versailles Restaurant. This is the day before his Miami court appearance. Um, and then we also had uh, Chris Christie on the campaign trail. This is Versailles. This is a landmark in Miami. This is a popular Cuban restaurant. But you also have appearances by Republicans, especially former President Trump, on radio, Spanish language radio, billboards. This is something that both the Democrats and Republicans are going to have to do, especially when we have 66 percent of the population here reporting speaking Spanish, especially targeting those Spanish language predominant neighborhoods. Um, and we do know that this is something 
that Democrats are talking about ramping up because visibility is going to be key here, guys. And as we've seen in previous elections before, both midterms and presidential elections, Miami-Dade is an important and key county when it comes to winning the battleground state of Florida. Mm, Back absolutely. to you guys. Absolutely. A lot to watch where you are. Very interesting. Marissa Parra, thank you so much. A powerful storm system is bringing strong winds, heavy rain, and flooding to the East Coast today. Michelle Grossman is here in the studio to tell us more. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning. And it is a big storm. It was a miserable weekend for many along the East Coast. And it's a miserable Monday morning in the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, into portions of New England. We have very heavy rain falling. It's a slow commute, ponding on the roadways. The winds are really starting to pick up. We could see winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour in some spots. This is what it looks like on radar. You could see those brighter colors. That's where the heaviest rain is falling so there is a lot of it be careful as you head out this morning but we're looking at the back end of this storm so you can see down the mid-atlantic that is the back edge so we're going to start to clear as we go throughout the later part of the morning in the mid-atlantic also the northeast it's going to linger longer in portions of new england and we're going to see the potential for some flooding rains there we're going to see the winds continuing so more power outages we have a lot of power outages right now in the state of new york also throughout new england as well then on the back edge of the system we're pulling in really cold air so it's mild today in portions of the northeast New England. Big difference tomorrow. We're going to drop about 20 degrees in some spots, but cold enough along the Great Lakes into the Appalachians where we're looking at lake effect snow, and we could see up to a foot of snow in some spots. Flood alerts. We're looking at 59 million people under flood alerts. We have lots of flash flood warnings. That is in the red. That means flooding is happening right now, or it's imminent where you see the green. That is a flood watch. So portions of the northeast into New England, we're looking at really, really wet conditions. This is not a tropical storm, but it really is acting like one with lots of water and lots of wind. In terms of rainfall totals, we're not looking a whole lot in the mid-Atlantic. Most of the Northeast looking pretty good as we go forward in terms of additional rainfall. But we're looking a lot through New England. Even up to three, four inches of rain is still expected. And we're looking at really soggy grounds. The winds will be blowing, so we're going to see trees coming down. Winter alerts, 13 million people impacted. We have winter weather advisories. That is in the white. Winter storm watches, winter storm warnings. That's in that pinker color. And we could see up to a foot of snow in some spots. Where you see those purples and pinks, that's the highest amount. So downwind in the Great Lakes, also along the Appalachians, we're looking at some really heavy snowfall. Not just today, but into tomorrow. We'll start to see it wrap up tomorrow. And then the wind alerts, 46 million people impacted from portions of the mid-Atlantic, the Carolinas, into parts of New England. We have high wind warnings, 50, 60, 70 mile per hour winds. Remember, uh, that's close to hurricane force winds with really soggy, soggy uh, grounds. That's not a good combination. So winds gusting as we go throughout the rest of this morning. We're going to see 40s, 50s, even 65 miles per hour in Nantucket. Could see a little higher there as well. Up through New England, we're looking at 59 miles in Portland, or at least that's what we're expecting as we go throughout the next couple of hours. And this is the setup here. We're going to see gradual clearing throughout the Northeast. We're looking at scattered snow showers, snow showers, but could see a lot of snow on the back end of this as that cold air kind of be, t continues to wrap in. And then tomorrow, staying breezy, but we dry out. So that's good news. We're going to see those lingering snow throughout the Great Lakes. We're also really wet along the West as well. This is not just today, tomorrow, but also Wednesday. We have a series of fronts that will continue to move on shore. The first one today, so from the Pacific Northwest all the way down through portions of Cal California, really most of the wet, uh, West Coast will be wet today with higher elevation snow, and we're looking at that lower elevation rain. And we could see quite a bit of rain as we head throughout the next few days. The next storm will be on deck, and we're looking at a cold front moving through tomorrow. And again, it will stay in place on Wednesday. So, guys, we're looking locally up to five inches, especially in portions of Northern California, so Eureka, Chico, down to San Francisco. So we are wet on both coasts, but really looking nice in the middle of the country. We're back now with developing international news. North Korea has launched an unprecedented military drill, renewing nuclear fears here in the U.S. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now from Cairo with that and other world headlines. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Valerie. That's right. North Korea has produced its first intercontinental ballistic missile test after the launch of its first military reconnaissance satellite last month. The launch is speculated to be in response to U.S. and South Korean moves to boost their nuclear deterrence plans. South Korea described the missile test as a solid-fueled weapon, making its launch more difficult for adversaries to detect than liquid-fueled weapons. Uh, the South Korean military say the ICBM 
flew about 620 miles before plunging into the water between the Korean Peninsula and Japan. Over to Chile, where voters rejected a proposed conservative constitution to replace Chile's dictatorship-era charter, underscoring deep divisions in the country and an inability to address people's demands for change made four years ago. The vote came more than a year after Chileans resoundingly rejected a proposed constitution written by a left-leaning convention and one that many characterized as one of the world's most progressive charters. And finally, a Christmas tree purchased over a century ago for pennies has sold at auction for over $4,000. The modest tree, which was expected to sell for no more than $100, is only 31 inches tall with 25 branches. It was delivered to Dorothy Grant in England in 1920 when she was just eight years old. She treasured the tree until her passing at the age of 101 in 2014. And those are your headlines, guys. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Allie, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, in the United Kingdom, a court ruled over the weekend that Prince Harry's cell phone had been hacked by the Mirror Group. That's a British-based tabloid. Now there are calls in the UK for more regulation to rein in newspapers. Sky News' Katie Spencer has that story. A partial victory for Prince Harry with profound implications for the British media landscape. While newspapers say they've moved on from the dark arts of 20 years ago, the passing of time doesn't stop those who were in charge back then from being any less culpable. The ruling that those in senior positions at MGN, like former chief executive Sly Bailey and former editor Piers Morgan, knew about hacking and blagging, now puts the ball firmly in the police's court. Despite Morgan's repeated denials over the years, if the law was indeed broken, it's no longer a civil matter, but a criminal one. I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. And nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. About time, say the whistleblowers, who have repeatedly alleged top management knew and covered up. It's difficult for me because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to see journalists go to jail or, or lose their jobs. But at the very least, they could tell the truth. If you're wondering whether those employing Morgan for his journalistic integrity might consider taking him off air in the interim, well, that'll be for his talk TV boss Richard Wallace to decide, also a former editor of The Mirror. More widely, the court's ruling will have a domino effect for other newspapers involved in legal proceedings with Prince Harry. Many of those private investigators who worked for MGN worked for their titles too. It, of course, also calls into question everything that was said under oath back in 2011 at the Leveson Inquiry. The judge finding that at the same time as the public inquiry into culture, practices and ethics was taking place, remarkably, the practice of unlawful information gathering still continued. Up until now, the Conservatives have leaned towards less regulation, in fact, dropping the second part of the Leveson inquiry. But campaigners would argue that this judgment is evidence of a press regulatory system that's failed. The question is whether the government wants to change anything. Will they want to go to war with the newspapers with an election looming? A royal reckoning with print media unleashing a can of worms. I hope it would put the fear into the boots of newspaper editors up and down the country that, look, if you use illegal means, whether it's phone hacking, whether it's private investigators, wiretapping, whatever, to obtain those stories, you will be found out. The ruling might be over practices from a different era, but the judgment is damning. At a time when the newspaper world is dying, of redundancies, of struggling readership numbers, the fallout from Harry's battle for accountability looks set to unleash hell when the industry was already on its knees. Katie Spencer, Sky News. We're back with a look at the homeless crisis here in the U.S. As new data shows, homelessness has reached record levels this year. Local leaders say they don't see the issue slowing down anytime soon. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin has more. Take a drive down Los Angeles' Skid Row, filled with tents, people, and growing frustration. If I can get back in to another uh, residence, then I won't make the same mistakes I made before. According to new federal data, a record number of people are now unhoused, more than 653,000, a 12% population increase since last year. Mel Tilakaratna runs a nonprofit that provides free showers to people living on the street. The system is completely overwhelmed. Tilakaratna points to a rise in housing costs, the opioid epidemic, mental health issues, and the migrant crisis as factors exacerbating the problem in LA. 
We have families, asylum seekers to families in LA who become homeless and prior where we would be able to send them to a motel or a shelter within a couple of days, now there's absolutely no resources. These issues are also creating friction in major cities. Back in September, New York Mayor Eric Adams revealed new fears as tens of thousands of asylum seekers flooded the city. I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. In Phoenix, the city recently cleared a large encampment located downtown. It seems that the quote unquote cleanup that the city did just spread the mess out a lot further. People going through everyone's dumpsters, dragging stuff out into the streets. Across LA, officials have tried to clear out encampments. They come hit tents and then all your stuff will be gone. This year, Los Angeles County declared a state of emergency. Since then, officials say they have provided health services, counseling, substance abuse treatment, and found temporary housing for more than 15,000 people and permanent housing for more than 8,000. But even those resources are not enough for frustrated business owners like this woman who doesn't want to be identified. We'll feed them. We offer food, but if they don't want it, what can we do? It's very frustrating. They'll throw things at you and they'll grab you. A growing national problem that could take decades to fix. Dana Griffin, NBC News, Los Angeles. Now to a chilling announcement from the FDA. This is about several types of applesauce that potentially poison dozens of kids. Well, according to the agency, the poisonings may have been deliberate. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has the details. The FDA says it is investigating if someone deliberately tampered with ingredients used in certain cinnamon apple puree pouches using a cheaper product to make more money. It's called economically motivated adulteration, and it may have been responsible for the lead poisoning of dozens of young children. I think it's absolutely disgusting that you would knowingly do that to make an extra dollar. Say hi. Ricky and Sarah Callahan say they regularly gave their son Rudy these Wanabana apple cinnamon fruit puree pouches. Those as well as Weiss and Schnook cinnamon apple sauces now all voluntarily recalled due to reports yeah. of elevated We're levels back. of lead. The Callahan suspect those pouches poisoned their 15 Good month old job. son. How is he feeling? So since he's been diagnosed with lead poisoning, uh, We've found out that Rudy has a little bit of a speech delay. It's not clear where in the supply chain the puree may have been compromised, but the FDA suspects the cinnamon may be the source of unusually high lead levels. Wanabana did not respond to our request for comment, but has previously said it is working closely with the FDA to investigate the source of the contamination. Even if they find that it was intentionally put into the cinnamon, even at the source, testing of that product should have occurred at some level. So far, the FDA has received at least 65 reports of lead poisoning in children under age six, which doctors say can have serious consequences. Some stomach upset, a little bit of fatigue, all the way to somewhat permanent and life altering events such as damage to the brain and developmental delays. Concerns leaving parents like the Callahans left to worry. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. We're back with some financial headlines now, and a major strike could be in store at Anheuser-Busch factories across the U.S. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us with that and more. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Well, the Teamsters union says members have voted to authorize a strike at Anheuser-Busch. The union's current contract expires at the end of February. The Teamsters are seeking to improve wages, protect jobs, and secure health care and retirement benefits for 5,000 workers at the company's 12 U.S. breweries. A vote to authorize a strike is a common practice in contract talks and may not result in a walkout. Earlier this year, Teamsters at UPS and hospitality workers in Las Vegas voted to strike, but ultimately reached new deals. Meantime, Apple is testing a way for app developers to bundle discounts for customers with more than one subscription. It could help them lure in people with cheaper subscriptions based on other purchases, be it their own apps or another participating partner. Apple says the bundled discounts will be highly visible to customers on the App Store, so you can easily find and take advantage of them. The test comes as Apple's practices with the App Store and how it handles in-app purchases are being scrutinized by the courts and regulators on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Finally, it was a sweet opening for Wonka, which topped the weekend box office with 39 million. That's according to Comscore. The Warner Brothers movie explains how the inventor, magician, and chocolate maker becomes Willy Wonka. For Hollywood, the strong showing is boosting hopes for a positive end to the year. Wonka is the first major release since the actor's strike ended, and studios are targeting a $9 billion in box office sales for 2023. Back to you. I want to see that movie. I do too. Yeah, me too. It looks <laughs> awesome. Pippa, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we are a week away from Christmas, and in the final stretch, then, of course, of the holiday shopping season. This year, shoppers are facing record high credit card debt and high interest rates, which means it can be easy to bust your budget, especially if you have a lot of names on your shopping list. So how can you get your shopping squared away without going into debt? Emily Irwin, Senior Director of Advice for Wells Fargo, joins us now with some best practices. Emily, thanks for being with us this morning. Many people might be tempted to put their gifts on their credit card and then worry about paying for it after after the holidays, but is that a good idea? Good morning. Well, using a credit card isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're using it for a financially responsible reason, such as having all of your purchases consolidated on one statement so you can e easily manage them, or maybe you know you're going to get cash back on certain purchases that will help you in the future, that's a good reason to go ahead and use it. The caveat is if you know you're not going to be able to make that payment in January or February when the bill comes due, that's what you want to avoid. As you mentioned, interest rates are high. They can soar around 20 percent. And what you don't want is that holiday letdown to come early in the new year. And now you're struggling to be able to make your bills. I know you've got some tips for us. Give us I think there's kind of like three easy ones people can remember, people can follow as they're trying to finish up their holiday shopping. Absolutely. First of all, you want to prepare to shop. You want to go ahead and price shop. Look at different retailers. Some are already having early sales. Some aren't. You want to be sure that you're targeting those that maybe have sales available before the holidays. Second, determine your budget, your overall budget. It's helpful if you can even itemize down to the person. You want be, maybe a little bit more spendy on parents, maybe a little bit less spendy on someone who delivers your mail, for example. And then finally, make a written list. You want to think about both who are you buying for and what do you want to walk into that store or go online and click to purchase. And Emily, you touched on sales. A lot of stores are offering those deep discounts this mm -hmm. time of the year. What should shoppers look out for in order to get the most out of those deals? Well, you want to be sure that you look at return policies. That's really important this time of year. Make sure that you keep your receipts because the best thing, the worst thing that can happen is you get a great sale, you find out it's not the right fit or the right item, and you're not able to make um, to make an exchange or a return, and then you're out the money and out the gift. Second, look at shipping policies. Do you have an availability to have free shipping if you're going to be shipping? If you're going to be shipping using a third party, like such as USPS, FedEx, or UPS, be sure you insure those packages up to the value if something either breaks or goes missing and you know when they're going to be delivered. Sometimes if they miss that delivery date, you can actually go in and get a refund on what you pay to ship those items. How concerned should people be right now about getting those items, last minute shoppers, when we think about shipping and inventory? It's going to be tricky. We're one week away from the big day, and Santa's sleigh is going to be really hard to get where you need it to go. So I would say really, really pay attention. And if they say there's a chance it may not arrive, take that into heart and say it probably won't arrive by mm. that date. Yeah, it's a good call. Unfortunately, probably not going to happen. <laughs> Keep it in mind. Emily Irwin, Senior Director of Advice for Wells Fargo, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. We're just a week away from Christmas, but there's still some time if you haven't got your Christmas tree yet. Who doesn't have it yet? That's the joy of the season is to get to enjoy it. Well, there are plenty of options for real and artificial trees if you don't have one. Also, get this, you can even rent one. So how do you know which to choose? We are joined now by Bert Craig, a professor of horticulture and forestry at Michigan State University. Bert, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate you being here. Um, this is an interesting one. So let's start first on real trees because there are actually different options available it's not just what you might think of when you show up at you know a grocery store parking lot or on the street here in new york city do they all come from these tree farms yeah so most trees do come from tree farms and so the options people have would be a traditional cut tree 
And so the principal options there, you can go to a tree lot, you can go to a big box store, you can go to a garden center, those sorts of places. You can also choose and cut your own tree. And that became, of course, very popular here as we went through COVID and there weren't many options if things we could do outdoors. And so that's really the experience, right? You're going out looking for the tree, taking the family, the hot cocoa, the wagon ride, all of that. So uh, cut trees are certainly the vast majority of, of the option. And virtually all trees are grown on tree farms. Kind of a misconception people have is somehow that having a real Christmas tree is contributing to deforestation. All these trees are planted by growers. They're harvested for that purpose. Uh, a small percentage, uh, the U.S. Forest Service allows cutting of trees by permit for Christmas trees, but it's a small fraction of the market. What are some tips for maintaining the real tree if you do get that? So we always talk about fresh tree, fresh cut, fresh water. And so fresh tree means getting the freshest tree you can. If you do a choose and cut, pretty obvious, you know when that tree was cut. <laughs> if you're getting it from a lot, bear in mind right now, and some people do, it's, it's a tradition. Some people wait till later to get their tree. And so if you're doing that, understand that most of those trees on a tree lot right now probably were cut about a month ago. Uh, but that's okay as long as they've been cared for properly, that that's not a problem. And so what we encourage people to do is what we call the pull test. So take your thumb and forefinger, kind of pull along those branches and see if you get any needles coming off in your hand. You shouldn't. If you do, then, then keep looking for another tree. And then fresh cut is taking about an inch or so off the bottom of that tree and uh, with a saw, hand saw, and then that enables that uh, cut into that tree then to take up water better. And then fresh water, that's really the key. You don't need to add aspirin, anything else, sugar, soda pop. We hear these things uh, right behind me, behind my camera here, I've got our tree that we got about four weeks ago. I checked the water every day. We are still adding water to it uh, here four weeks out from when we cut it. So really imperative that people keep lots of water to their trees. Yeah. Mine's kind of stopped accepting it, which I think is a bad call. And if I did that <laughs> it, needle it, thing. It'll do that, and that's okay, but you want to make sure you keep keep adding it, keep checking it. Sometimes they'll fool you. They'll stop for a few days, and then they'll start again. Oh, okay. So don't, don't, don't forget oh. about it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I will run home and do that. Uh, let's talk about sustainability. What are the pros of getting a real tree versus buying an mm. artificial one? What should we know about that? Yeah, so with the artificial tree, um, the thing to bear in mind there is individual components, plastic, the metal are recyclable, but the whole tree itself is difficult to handle. And so the vast majority of artificial trees ultimately are going to end up in a landfill. So the longer you can hang on to your artificial tree, then, you know, in terms of environmental footprint, that's that's a better thing. Uh, if we're talking about a real tree, then we want to make sure at the end of the holidays that that tree gets recycled. So many of our communities now have recycling programs, either curbside pickup in some places, if you're very fortunate, uh, but at least uh, most communities have places where you can drop off your tree after the holidays and, and have it recycled. We have one grower here in Michigan Claude Farms, they, uh, if people bring their tree back, uh, they will uh, give you a, a seedling to plant. And so that kind of encourages people to, mm -hmm. to recycle. Bert, also, I mentioned renting a tree. What? Explain this. Yeah, so it's having a potted tree. And so it's pretty much a niche market. It's available in, on the West Coast in a few places and probably some other places in between. But having a live tree is not a new thing. We have lots of tree farms, lots of garden centers that will sell live trees. So you can plant the tree out after the holidays. Uh, and then the, the rental idea is just a take on that where the rental company has a nursery, potted trees, they'll bring it into your home. You display it for your three or four weeks, whatever you want. They come back, pick it up. They either take it back to their nursery, let it grow another year. It's a little bit bigger, but right will fit in somebody else's home at that point. Or if it's gone beyond the size, it's going to be able to be used again. Then they'll plant it at a park, something like that. Mm. Everything Who knew? Never knew about trees. Love that. <laughs> Bert Craig, thank you so much.
Welcome back. Love is in the air for Demi Lovato. The singer just got engaged over the weekend. Lovato told People Magazine that her fiance, Jordan Lutz, popped the question in a personal and intimate proposal. She announced her big news on Instagram with a caption saying, quote, I can't believe I get to marry the love of my life. Demi and I actually met earlier this year for an incredible conversation about mental health, a topic that we are both passionate about. So just absolutely, oh, there was a cute picture from it. Absolutely love her. So from us here at Morning News Now, best wishes to you, Demi and Jordan. Congratulations. Isn't that sweet, Valerie? That is. Tis the season, right? Exactly. Maybe Taylor's next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I don't yeah, know. All right. Thanks, Savannah. Yeah. We end this hour at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis and the incredible staff that worked tirelessly to help kids battling cancer. This morning, NBC News correspondent Harry Smith brings us the incredible story of one doctor who was once a patient herself. Ayan Gupta is good at many things, be it Rubik's Cube. Done or bottle toss. For him, conquering challenges has been child's play until... I couldn't believe it. I continued to say it was a lab error. Um, a lab error. He was completely normal with no complaints, no symptoms. No symptoms of acute lymphatic leukemia. Ion's parents are doctors, fortunate to live in Memphis. We knew St. Jude was the perfect place to be for the cancer that my child had. Treating childhood cancer is not kid stuff. The regimens are difficult. What parts of it did you not like? I didn't like taking the liquid medicines. So then I learned how to take pills. How much of a difference did it make to learn how to take a pill? It was much better. They eased his mind by talking to him through every single step of treatment or procedure. Ayan's doctor, it turns out, has a little extra in her resume. My name is Maggie Cupid Link. I take care of kids with cancer. Dr. Cupid Link herself was a patient at St. Jude when she was in college. What was the diagnosis? Ewing sarcoma, which is one of the types of childhood bone cancer. She was hospitalized for a year. My treatment included lots of chemotherapy, as well as a really big surgery where they removed the bones and the tumor and replaced it with metal. So this is my scar from the surgery. 19-year-old Maggie was not a model patient. I wish I could say that I was just, had a great attitude the whole time, but I did not. Until she took a good look at her fellow patients. They're so resilient and genuine and not afraid of death the way that grown-ups are. And then I knew if I live, then this is the kind of doctor I'll be. What does it mean to you to have a physician who's quite responsible for your son's health, mm -hmm. who was actually a patient here once herself. I think somewhere in the back of my head, I thought um, this child may not be able to do what he needed to do. Um, but when Dr. Maggie walked in and she told me that she herself was a patient and that she overcame all of this and is doing what she's doing now, I became hopeful <laughs> that Why he's allowed gosh. to dream and he's allowed to be whatever he wants to be. Yep. There's nothing better than the feeling of knowing that I'm helping these kids in a way that is unique because I understand something that they're going through. All of which makes for a really good story. But there's more. When I was just 21, I went into menopause. Dr. Cupid Link and her husband planned on adopting, but... So they woke up, the ovaries. Yes, Dr. Cupid Link got pregnant. It definitely is one of those moments where you realize that you're not in control of what happens to you. Healing is not only about science. We have definitely evolved in a way we never thought we would. Isn't that something? It totally is. Harry Smith, NBC News. No surprise, it's incredible coming from Harry, but what a story. Yeah, oh, exactly. So sweet. Congratulations mm. to her on her pregnancy as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us.
morning. Thanks so much for joining us on a Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Valerie Castro. Joe has the morning off. Right now on Morning News Now, we've got our eyes on some wicked weather that's battering much of the East Coast this morning with heavy rain and driving winds making for a soggy start to the work week for millions. We've got team coverage in just a moment on this massive storm's latest track. In the Middle East this morning, we're learning new details about those three Israeli hostages who were mistakenly shot and killed by the IDF on Friday. Our Richard Engel is on the ground with the latest. Also this morning, the new questions surrounding the death of actor Mike Matthew Perry that are now putting the effects of ketamine into the national spotlight. And later in the hour, we're talking the top travel trends of 2023 with something called not jet setting, but set jetting. We will explain. Yeah. That has something to do with White Lotus. Yes. <laughs> we start this hour with the latest on a severe weather system impacting millions of Americans. A massive storm brought damaging winds and flooding to parts of the East Coast overnight. Yeah, the bad weather's not done yet. Michelle's going to be here with your forecast in just a moment. But first, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa. She's in Jones Beach on New York's Long Island with the very latest here. Hey, Emily. Well, you can see and hear it. The wind has been howling and we could see gusts up to 60 miles an hour. It's a major concern with this storm system, which has already knocked out power to tens of thousands of people in the northeast. Here on Long Island, they're also watching for excessive flooding, which we saw wreak havoc for millions of people down the east coast. This morning, torrential downpours bringing new flood threats to the east coast, impacting 59 million people from Virginia to Maine. Heavy winds and rain rushing into the northeast overnight. Roads blocked as the busy morning commute begins. Over the weekend, the same system swept the south, hitting beach communities in Georgia and the Carolinas. High tides washing debris from the ocean onto the roads in Sullivan's Island, South Carolina. While in Charleston, three inches of rain broke the city's daily record on Sunday. This is not usually my backyard. It's not usually this flooded. Massive amounts of water also making driving dangerous, with vehicles getting stuck on flooded roads. Outside Myrtle Beach, a likely tornado causing extensive damage, tearing through homes and knocking down trees and power lines. One resident posting on social media, I have never heard winds like that. The fast-moving storm system started down in Florida, dumping up to seven inches of rain. Severe storm conditions even creating a possible power surge in St. Petersburg residents capturing this scary moment outside their home. Oh my God, get inside. And with all of this rain, some may be wondering, could there be snow in the forecast just a week out from Christmas? Well, for some communities between Cleveland and Buffalo and along the Appalachians, they could see up to a foot of snow this week. Back to you. Oh, my goodness. Emily, stay warm, stay safe. Thank you so much. Time now for a check at your Morning News Now weather. Yeah, Michelle Grossman is back with us to track where that storm is lingering, where it's headed. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Good morning, guys. Yeah, we are still seeing a whole lot of wind, a whole lot of water. This is not a tropical system, but really felt like one with all that water that is falling and continues to fall. So we're going to see the lingering storm in portions of the Northeast and New England. We're going to start to clear it out gradually in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. So by 10, 11 a.m., looking better or starting to look better. But it's going to linger in portions of New England. We could see some flooding rains there throughout the afternoon hours. On the back side of this system, Emily sort of alluded to this, we're looking at colder air really filtering into the system. It's being wrapped into the system, and we're looking at the uh, impacts of lake effect snow. We could see up to a foot in some spots. Really quiet through the middle of the country. We are wet in the west. We're going to see a series of fronts once again moving onshore. That's going to bring some rain from the Pacific Northwest all the way through most of California, not just today, but tomorrow, and then it's going to linger in the state of California on Wednesday as well. So this is Wednesday. There's that rain and snow, higher elevation snow. Could see a lot of snow in the Sierras, lower elevation rain. And notice those reds, orange, yellows. I've said this before, but that's where we're expecting the most amounts of rain. Plenty of sunshine throughout the middle of the country. Temperature's not that bad in the south central states. The Tennessee Valley, the Ohio Valley, the Midwest were dry too. By Wednesday in the northeast, above average temperatures in parts of New England. And then by Friday, we're still relatively quiet, although we're looking at travel impacts in the west. We're looking at some higher elevation snow. We're looking some elevation rain. That's going to cause some travel delays there. Unseasonably warm throughout the northern part of the nation. And we're soggy in parts of the Midwest all the way down to the south central states. We're finally dry, though, for a Friday. Hopefully Sunday. We'll have to look a little bit for, uh, further into the future there, but we're looking at dry conditions along the east coast there. So in terms of this storm's alert, we're looking at 50 million people under flood alerts. Where you see the green from Philadelphia to New York City, Albany into Burlington, Bangor, we're looking at those flood alerts 
efforts continuing. We're also looking at some flash flood warnings right now because we're looking at flooding conditions in some spots. We're going to add on the wind alerts too. 41 million people at risk for really high winds. We've already seen winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour in some spots. We could see winds gusting up to 70 miles per hour spots along the New England coast into portions of New York as well and extending all the way down to portions of the Appalachians. Winter alerts 19 million people. We're looking at the chance for lots of snow in some spots along the Great Lakes up to a foot in some spots and look at all that rain that is still really heavy it is a tough morning for many of us especially with those brighter colors we're looking at torrential downpours we're looking at ponding on the roadways we're looking at flooding conditions and also debris on the roadways so a really tough Monday morning commute this is what it looks like for the rest of the day we'll see that gradually clearing throughout the northeast lingering in parts of New England and then we're looking at that snow continuing on the back side of this system that will continue into tomorrow we're going to clear that out but it's still going to be pretty breezy as we head towards Tuesday and much colder than where, where, where we are today. We're going to be above normal. Additional rainfall, not as much in uh, portions of the Northeast, also mid-Atlantic, but lots throughout parts of New England. We're looking at up to four inches, up to a foot of snow in parts of the Great Lakes and really, really windy conditions. So guys, we're looking at the chance for Whew. more power outages. We have a bunch throughout Connecticut, throughout New mm. England, also throughout portions of the Northeast. Not a great time of year for that either. Ugh, it's no, right. Ugh. Ugh. It's going to be cold yeah. tomorrow. Thanks, All right, Michelle. Michelle, thank you so sure. much. Well, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is facing backlash this morning after his defense forces killed three hostages held in Gaza. Officials in Israel say their deaths were an accident. Now their families are demanding answers. And more Israelis are calling on Netanyahu to resume hostage negotiations with Hamas. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has the latest from Jerusalem. NBC News has confirmed that ceasefire negotiations have resumed with the directors of the CIA and Israeli Mossad meeting with Qatari officials as anger in Israel is growing as new details emerge about the three Israeli hostages killed on Friday by friendly fire. The three Israeli hostages in Gaza made white flags to warn their own army not to shoot, smearing SOS in old food and writing in Hebrew, help three hostages. The Israeli military released the images overnight, saying the hostages were nonetheless mistakenly shot by Israeli troops. Israel's chief of staff told soldiers the friendly fire could have been avoided, saying the hostages took off their shirts so that no one would think they have an explosive device and held a white cloth on a pole to identify themselves. They came speaking Hebrew, calling for help, he said, telling the troops never to shoot anyone with their hands up. The families of hostages still in Gaza are outraged, calling daily for Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to resume negotiations with Hamas and bring their loved ones home. I am angry that the government let this get let this situation get so far. I am angry at the world that is not supporting a deal right now because this is the only way to bring them back home. And I am angry at right now. I'm angry at all. Opinion polls suggest Israelis remain united in their support for the war in Gaza to destroy Hamas, but not in Prime Minister Netanyahu's leadership. Under U.S. pressure, this weekend, Israel opened a second crossing into Gaza for humanitarian supplies, but it's still far too little. 12-year-old Rosan al-Habash, displaced from her home in northern Gaza, says she waits in line for hours to get food for her family. Every day I wake up at 8 and leave for the food bank. Sometimes we spend the day without eating anything, she says. Human Rights Watch this morning accused Israel of using starvation as a war crime. Yesterday, with international pressure growing, the Israeli military continued to make its case for the offensive, releasing video of what it calls the largest tunnel it's found underneath the Gaza Strip and showing a man the military identified as the brother of a top Hamas leader driving through it. NBC News has not been able to verify the footage. This conflict is spreading beyond Gaza and Israel out to sea, with Iranian-backed Houthi militias firing on ships in the Red Sea over the weekend and again this morning, U.S. and British warships responding. There were no reports of casualties or significant damage. All right, Richard, thank you so much for your continued reporting here. On Capitol Hill, the House may have adjourned for holiday recess, but the Senate decided to delay its holiday break and return this week to hammer out a deal on immigration and aid to Ukraine and Israel. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig joins us now. So, Garrett, where do things stand with talks this morning? What are we hearing from Senate leadership? 
Well, Valerie, the Senate negotiators were in all weekend. They met for several hours Saturday, several hours again on Sunday. They are saying all the right things about trying to reach a deal, but they're also cognizant that time is running short. And with senators coming back today, they don't have an agreement. They don't even have a framework. And you can't vote on either of those things. You would need text to vote on a bill. So uh, I think for people who want to see this deal get done, the optimistic case here is that things are moving forward, but that they're just not there yet. And Garrett, what would the consequences be of leaving this issue unresolved through the holidays? Well, look, there could be consequences on the battlefields in Ukraine and in Gaza, uh, especially in Ukraine, where the fear is that the drawdown authority, the ability for the White House, for the American government to keep sending military aid to Ukraine is about to be badly impaired and could affect the war there. But also there's political consequences, too. Dealing with this in January just makes everything harder. In January, we've got the first of these funding deadlines to keep the government up and running. And we're also going to have the presidential race getting going in full swing, doing anything as political politically uh, delicate as reforming the immigration system during a presidential campaign is just harder and harder than it would be to do it now just before the end of the year. So, Garrett, although the Senate is back today, the House is not returning this week to push this legislation. Why is that? And what's been the reaction from the White House? Well, the House says there's no legislation to push, and right now they're right. I mean, they don't want to keep their members here sitting in town twiddling their thumbs if there's not a bill for them to vote on. And so the Speaker has sent everybody home. I think it's possible, although I think it's a very low likelihood, that if somehow the Senate got a deal, passed it, maybe we'd see the House come back. But more likely, they're probably not going to vote uh, on anything until early to potentially even mid-January. They don't want to get jammed here. That's not unusual. And the White House is involved in these talks now, finally. I think a lot of lawmakers we're uh, glad to see Secretary Mayorkas from the DHS uh, start showing up and being engaged in these conversations. Right now, the president has had something of a hands-off approach, but I think as this gets closer to the possibility of actually becoming law, we might have to see Joe Biden get his hands dirty uh, in these negotiations, because ultimately he's going to have to sign it and sell whatever they agreed to to the American people. All right. Garrett Haig, thank you for your reporting. You bet. Well, overnight, there was a security scare outside President Biden's campaign headquarters in Delaware. A car collided with his motorcade while the president was just steps away. His reaction was caught on camera just as the Secret Service jumped into action. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us from Washington with the details here. Hey, Gabe, good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Good morning. It's not every day you see a collision just feet away from the president of the United States. And it happened as the president and the first lady were heading home for the night. Thankfully, both of them are safe and were not hurt. Overnight, President Biden leaving a dinner with staff at his campaign headquarters in Delaware. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the polls? When all of a sudden, a, a car plowed into a vehicle that was part of his Secret Service detail. The president appeared startled by the collision before Secret Service agents hustled him into an armored SUV. Additional agents drew their guns on the driver who put his hands up. The president and the first lady were not hurt in what appears to be an accident. The unusual security scare coming as the 2024 campaign heats up less than a month before the Iowa caucuses. Over the weekend, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump in Nevada and New Hampshire, where he made controversial comments about undocumented immigrants. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. The Biden campaign accusing Trump of parroting Adolf Hitler, who used similar wording in his writings. But only one of Trump's Republican rivals have blasted him for the remark. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans. Trump also called North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un very nice, and he quoted Russian President Vladimir Putin as he argued the four criminal indictments he's facing are political payback. Vladimir Putin of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. One new poll out of New Hampshire has former Ambassador Nikki Haley in a strong second in the state, following the endorsement of its governor, Chris Sununu. I'm going to fight to earn every single person's vote because we have a country to save. While Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, betting big on Iowa, is ramping up his attacks against the former president. Trump loses, he will say it's stolen no matter what. Absolutely. He will, he will, he will try to delegitimize the results.
As for the collision near the president, it is not clear what, if any, charges or citations that driver might face. The Wilmington, Delaware Police Department is investigating whether he may have been impaired. Savannah? All right, Kate, thank you very much. Welcome back. We are so excited about our next guest. In August, NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 mission launched to the International Space Station. Now they're already more than halfway through their six-month mission, and the work they are doing is pretty neat. They are conducting more than 200 science experiments and technology demonstrations to prepare for missions to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. And guess what? We have them joining us now live from space. We are with astro NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli and Expedition 70 Commander Andreas Mogensen. Thank you so much for joining us, both of you. We are so excited to talk to you. It really blows my mind that we even can talk to you. Jasmine, I will start with you. I know that you were selected by NASA to join the 2017 astronaut candidate class, and now you are currently on your first mission in space. So what's it been like? You've been up there for four months. How's it going? It's been awesome. So I was a little nervous before launching. I was like, well, you know, I've wanted this my entire life. What if I get up there? And I'm like, oh, you know, this is just OK. Um, but it is not disappointed at all. Um, floating is just the coolest thing. <laughs> Looking back at Earth, uh, I mean, every time I look back at Earth, I'm, I'm blown away. Um, and then the International Space Station itself is just um, an absolute marvel of human engineering. So uh, I've loved every moment up here and it's going by way too quickly. Oh, that is so neat to hear and, and satisfying to hear that floating is as fun and cool as we all think it would be. Um, Andreas, I know that you're now, look at that, look at the mic. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you for indulging us in that. Um, Andreas, you're more than halfway through the mission. I mentioned your commander here. Tell us about your role and what you'll have tackled so far during this mission at the International Space Station. And I said, all those science experiments, things like that, what exactly does that mean? Well, we have a, a terrific team up here. We are seven astronauts on board the International Space Station, um, and we get along uh, really well. We uh, learned or we got to know each other during the uh, year and a half of training prior to launch. And uh, everything's been going really smoothly so far. And we've been able to concentrate on the scientific research and technology development that we do up here. And it really spans the, uh, the gamut from physics, chemistry, biology, human physiology, medicine, to material science, atmospheric science. I mean, just to give you a couple of uh, examples, lately we've been working on... Um, uh, brain cells to understand how uh, cells age in space. Uh, we've been working with our biofabrication facility, which essentially is a, a 3D printer for human tissue where we can print wow. uh, simulants of, of human organs uh, and other uh, oh, human right. tissues. Um, yeah, it, it's really incredible. We've been studying giant lightning strikes uh, that shoot upwards uh, out towards the edge of space from the top of thunderclouds. So really, it's a very wide variety of scientific uh, research we can do up here. Wow, no kidding. That's incredible that this same team is doing all those different types of things. You guys are just amazing. Jasmine, I know you are part of the fourth all-female spacewalk in history. I love this. I have interviewed Christina Cook before. I'm not sure. I assume you all maybe kind of at least know each other, but, you know, I know she was part of the first couple. Um, what was it like for you to know that you are now part of history, being part of that fourth walk, and just kind of what it means to be? What does it feel like to be, to know that you are doing this with just all women and that it's breaking barriers? barriers. First off, just going out on my first spacewalk uh, itself was just one of the top experiences of my entire life. Um, just being out there, knowing you're relying on yourself, your crewmate and the team back on the ground, going out with Laurel, who's a good friend of mine, um, and also uh, one of my classmates uh, from the 2017 selection on her face, first spacewalk as well. And then, you know, on the ground guiding us through was Anne McLean, who I overlapped with at Test Pilot School. So just a, a great group overall to be uh, working with and, and really proud of, of what we accomplished. Oh, absolutely. Well, this last question is for the both of you. 
you just you know I know that it sounds like you both love what you do which is just so incredible to hear you talk about um, but you're also away from your families of course it's the holidays what helps you get through being apart from loved ones especially at a time of year like this when you are in space Well, the good thing is, uh, even though we're in space, we're not uh, that isolated anymore. Thanks to, uh, uh, you know, our communication uh, assets up here, we can, uh, you know, talk to our uh, f uh, family and friends on video um, almost daily if we want to. Uh, we also have access to email and, and, and the Internet. So there's lots of opportunities for us to keep contact with our family and friends, uh, mm. especially over here in the during the holidays, which is nice. Absolutely. And then I just tried to, tried to find little ways to connect uh, with my family back home and, and my two girls. Um, you know, uh, we just finished up Hanukkah celebrations each night. I would mm. send them a video of me putting a, another light on the felt <laughs> menorah they had sent up for me. Um, oh. I've got my crew quarters decorated with <laughs> ornaments, which are mostly pictures of my girls or us as a family. So just little things to, to feel connected uh, to them back home. Okay, the dreidel spinning in space is a pretty epic video. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Jasmine Mogbelli, Andreas Mogensen, we appreciate you both. Thank you so much. And what an incredible, exciting thing you guys are up there doing. We really appreciate you calling in all the way from the International Space Station. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. <laughs> what a cool interview. <laughs> Ahead of what's expected to be a very busy holiday travel period, the State Department says it's working to fix something that's given millions of American travelers a headache this year, those frustratingly long wait times to get or renew your passport. Here with more on what's being done to help is NBC News Chief Washington Correspondent and MSNBC host Andrea Mitchell. Good morning, Andrea. With the State Department processing a record-breaking 24 million passports this year, it has added staff and overtime to finally reduce a common complaint for American travelers, the wait time to get new passports or renewals, just in time for the holidays. With the holiday travel season now here, the State Department is stepping up its efforts to ensure Americans can take that dream overseas family vacation with ease. Standard passport renewals take six to eight weeks by mail, or if expedited, two to three weeks. But what if at the last minute you realize you've lost your passport or it's expired? These anxious travelers rush to a passport office to get one the same day. Christopher Donald for his 11-year-old son, Gabriel. We are going to Spain, to Portugal, to Italy, the Netherlands, and to London. Passport processing has improved dramatically. When travel picked up after COVID, renewals took 10 to 13 weeks to process. Now they're up to date. We had to do a lot of overtime. Um, How were, much? Well, thousands of hours per month for an extended period of time. We really worked our staff as much as we could. The photo requirements can cause delays. You've got to have a photo that's a specific size. He has a, can't be smiling. There's all kinds of requirements on that. So, And you like to smile. I love to smile. And the new passports have laminated photo pages, similar to a credit card to make them even more difficult to counterfeit. We consider our passport the golden standard of passports in, in the world. Rachel Gomez and her husband were packing to take two-year-old Eugenia and five-year-old Mercedes to visit grandma and grandpa in Valencia, Spain, just hours before their afternoon flight. How did you realize that Mercedes's passport had expired? In the worst of ways, we were packing our passports and we literally realized that it's expiring next week. And so we couldn't come back in without her passport. Yep, it's all good. The passport office rushed Mercedes's passport through in a few short hours. Raquel grabbed her kids and raced off to try and catch their plane. The next step coming sometime in 2024, the rollout of a website where you can renew your passport online. Just remember, don't smile for the photo and no selfies if you want to avoid more delays. All right, Andrea Mitchell, thanks so much. No, no, smiling. <laughs> no smiling. Yeah, there you go. International headlines now. Northern Australia is seeing record rainfall, leaving behind disastrous flooding. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now from Cairo. Good morning, Ali. 
Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Valerie. That's right. Flash floods in North Queensland, Australia, have forced an entire town to be evacuated, with some people trapped on a hospital roof in what authorities expect to be Australian, the Australian region's worst ever flood. Extreme weather driven by a tropical cyclone has dumped a year's worth of rain on some areas. Images show planes submerge at Cairns Airport, a crocodile scene in the middle of the town, and people fleeing in boats. So far, thankfully, Hopefully, no fatalities have been reported. Self-made millionaire and pro-democracy tycoon Jimmy Lay has gone on trial in Hong Kong on charges of breaching national security and colluding with foreign forces. Mr. Lay, who's been held in solitary confinement for the past three years, is an outspoken critic of the Chinese Communist Party. If convicted, he faces life in prison. His case is seen as a test of Hong Kong's judicial independence. And finally, a tattered 80-year-old threadbare teddy bear has been resurrected as a Christmas present for an 87-year-old owner by his wife. The bear was given to Graham Windsor in England in 1939 at the outbreak of World War II, providing him comfort as Nazi bombs rained down around him. The couple said the bear was one of the best Christmas presents they've ever had. You never grow out of a teddy bear, do you? No, and those you are your certainly headlines, do not. <laughs> Welcome back. Authorities have released the autopsy report for the death of beloved Friends star Matthew Perry. Yeah, the report says the actor died from acute effects of the drug ketamine and has ruled his death an accident. NBC News Now anchor Kate Snow joins us now with more on this. She's here on set with us. Hey, Kate, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. So since the news broke on Friday, there have been a lot of questions about ketamine. It's an anesthetic and a hallucinogen that we've talked about before. It's sometimes used recreationally. It can be found illegally, but recently it's also been studied for its potential to treat mental health disorders, including depression. And now it's being blamed for the death of Matthew Perry, who talked openly about his struggle with substance use. This morning, new questions surrounding Matthew Perry's death as the world remembers the beloved star. I'm going to hug you. You hug me. All right. <laughs> In an autopsy report released Friday, the medical examiner determined the 54-year-old died from the acute effects of ketamine, ruling his death an accident. Ketamine is a fast-acting hallucinogen approved by the FDA as an anesthetic. It gained popularity as a party drug because it boosts feel-good chemicals in the brain and causes a euphoric effect. But recently, ketamine has increasingly been offered off-label at clinics to treat depression and other mental health disorders and has even been studied to treat alcohol and drug abuse. Perry was known for his light-hearted on-screen persona. I'm not great at the advice. Can I interest you in a sarcastic comment? <laughs> but had a long history with addiction. It's so cunning, baffling, and powerful, alcoholism and addiction. It's a disease that we have, and we don't know that we have it. In his memoir released last year, the actor wrote about being given ketamine during rehab. Taking ketamine is like being hit in the head with a giant happy shovel. But the hangover was rough and outweighed the shovel. Ketamine was not for me, he wrote. It's unclear how Perry obtained the ketamine that led to his death. But according to officials, Perry was reported to be receiving ketamine infusion therapy for depression and anxiety, and his last treatment was a week and a half before his death. The examination found the amount of ketamine in his blood was equivalent to the amount used for general anesthesia, levels, the report says, too high to be residual from his last clinical treatment. Perry was found floating face down in his hot tub in October. One of the contributing factors, authorities also noted, a drug buprenorphine, approved by the FDA to treat opioid use disorder, which people often stay on for years. I just want to say that I, I love you. Recently, Friends co-star and close friend Jennifer Aniston told Variety that Perry was getting healthy, adding he wasn't struggling, he was happy. A witness who talked to investigators said Perry had been sober for 19 months. The autopsy found no evidence of other illicit drugs like cocaine, meth, heroin, fentanyl, none of that. For now, it's unclear if investigators will look into how Perry obtained ketamine. But, guys, this news is obviously very difficult for his family and for all his millions of fans. Yeah, and all the people that he helped, by the way, in right. every time that he opened up about this himself. That's right. Kate, thank you very much. Mm. Now let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar, who is here to better help explain ketamine. Good morning, Dr. Azar. We just heard about the effects of ketamine, but can you explain how it works in the body? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, you know, depending on what the ketamine is being used for, it has a number of different effects. Obviously, it's been used for decades as an anesthetic, but more recently, it has been found to be extraordinarily effective to treat depression. And it does so uh, by raising a, a level of a chemical called glutamate um, in the frontal part of the brain. And it's also thought to um, enhance or, or better shape those connections, what we call synapses in the brain, that are thought to help with resilience so that if the ketamine actually works to treat depression, it actually can help people sustain that potential benefit. As Kate mentioned, um, it, it is also used as an anesthetic and it can slow down the rate of breathing and too much ketamine can, ca can actually cause you to become unconscious, which is what is thought to have happened in the case of Matthew's uh, accidental death. And Dr. Azar, we understand that Matthew Perry may have been on a second medication in addition to ketamine. Tell us about that and, and how it works with opioid use disorder. Yes, that's that's exactly right. So yes, ketamine is also being studied in substance use disorder. In his system is something called buprenorphine. It is actually what we call like a partial opioid agonist, which means in, in layman's terms that it, it is a narcotic and it can function as an opioid, but it doesn't result in that same euphoria and pain relief and everything as a stronger opioid. So it is used to treat people with opioid use disorder. And when it's appropriately prescribed and, and patients are followed, it is very, very safe. The issue is that because it also acts as a narcotic, it can also slow down the rate of breathing. And so the thought is that the combination of the ketamine and the buprenorphine is probably what led to his, you know, significantly slowed breathing. And then because he was in a hot tub, that led to his drowning. Mm. And Dr. Azar, I know you just touched on it, what happens to the human body when someone takes too much ketamine, but is it easy to overdose on mm -hmm. ketamine? So, yeah, so everybody reacts differently to ketamine, and I don't know that we know exactly the, the dose that can lead to, to an overdose, but as Kate mentioned in her piece, he was on, the, the level that they found in his blood was basically in the middle range of what is used in anesthesia, so really a, a quite a significant amount. There's also an issue that ketamine acutely can raise your heart rate, it can raise your blood pressure, um, and while Matthew Perry did not die from a heart attack, the, the medical examiner clearly stated that he did have underlying coronary artery disease so there was probably some strain on his heart and in this situation really it was it appears to be a perfect storm of a number mm. of different things each one in isolation may not have caused his death but the combination clearly uh, clearly did mm. all right dr. Azar as always thank you so much we're back with what's making financial headlines this morning. There are new reports that Japan's Nippon Steel will buy U.S. Steel. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with that and more at Other Money News. Good morning, Pippa. Hey, Valerie. Well, Japan, Japan's Nippon Steel is striking a deal to buy U.S. Steel for more than $14 billion. The move coming months after U.S. Steel put itself up for sale and it rejected an offer from rival Cleveland Cliffs. U.S. Steel has struggled for several years with falling profit and revenue, making it an attractive target for rivals looking to add a maker of steel used by the auto industry. Nippon Steel says it will honor all collective bargaining agreements with United Steelworkers Union. Southwest Airlines has agreed to pay $140 million to settle government investigations into the service meltdown during the holidays last year. The airline canceled thousands of flights, stranding more than 2 million passengers. About 90 million will go towards travel vouchers for people who were delayed. Even before the settlement, Southwest says the meltdown costed more than $1 billion in refunds, reimbursements, and lost ticket sales. And nearly two-thirds of Americans do not expect their personal finances to improve in 2024, including more than a quarter who believe their situation will get worse. A new survey from Bankrate finds inflation is the most commonly cited reason, along with flat or reduced income and changing interest rates. Of those who have a financial goal for next year, the most popular are paying down debt, getting a higher paying job or another source of income, and saving more for emergencies. Valerie, back to you. All right, Pippa, thank you so much.
As we prepare to say goodbye to 2023, it's time to look back now on the year in travel. It's been a rocky road for the travel industry this year. Airlines received a record-breaking number of complaints amid ticket prices that jumped 25 percent. Meanwhile, set jetting was the trend of the year, so if you travel to see the filming location of a show or movie, you were not alone. Here with us now to discuss is travel expert Mark Elwood. Mark, thanks for being with us Pleasure. this morning. So airlines were hit with a record number of complaints this year, 38,000 travel Travelers filed complaints in the mm -hmm. first half of 2023, which is double what it was last year. So what are some of the things that people complained about the most? Well, I think most important, just to pause and say, they complained so much that the Department of Transport stopped issuing <laughs> monthly tallies because they couldn't keep track. Right. People were complaining about delays and cancellations. I don't need to tell any of you that because I think we all experienced, if you flew this year, mm -hmm. you probably had a delay or a cancellation. The issues really were twofold. We're seeing climate change make our climate really unpredictable. Storm in New York last summer that really caused chaos. And then we've got real problems with staffing. Air traffic controllers, the certified air traffic controllers were down 10% in the decade to 2022. We don't have enough people to cater to the fact we want to go everywhere even more. And the holidays are coming up. Christmas is just a week yeah. away. Everyone's getting ready to oh. head to the airport again. What tips do you have so people can avoid some of the headaches that they saw last year? Don't pack wrapped gifts, remember. You've got to be able to let them see that. Uh, get uh, the, You always want the airlines app to make sure that you can check what's going on. I recommend Flighty, which is a great app that sort of goes around the airlines and often notifies you earlier. Those early morning flights, always better because the plane is already there. And when you're packing, remember that. Uh, a little scented candle, it's one of my holiday tips, looks like a wick in a bomb and will often mean that at security, you'll need extra <laughs> hand searching. So maybe leave that one at home. Leave that out or take it out of the, ba take it out of the bag before it goes Another in. trip that I saw there that my parents have really gotten into okay. is putting the little tracker in their suitcases. Jeannie, I do it every time my bag went astray in Venice. I knew exactly where it was. I could get it within two or three hours. So smart. Okay. Uh, can travelers expect any relief in ticket prices next year? <laughs> okay. There is good news. Ticket prices next year are predicted to go up about 1%. So in other words, they're going to stabilize. Mm -hmm. I think the big issue actually is hotels. In Italy this summer, uh, prices for hotels were up 51% versus 2019, wow. which was already a ban a year. So I think you're going to see hotel prices continue to rise, even if the uh, airline prices stabilize. So some good news, some bad news. Yeah, so maybe factor that into your budget for next year. Yeah, totally. Okay, uh, the trend this year was set jetting. <laughs> yeah. I think I said earlier, White Lotus probably played a role in that. I mean, did you, did you go to, I think. I you, did not go, but it you, seemed like people went to go see it. I will tell you that Sicily had a ban a year. That hotel, that Four Seasons Hotel had a ban a year. I know the Four okay. Seasons people very well. They told me that it was a real driver of bookings. Emily in Paris, getting people to Paris, That's to the true. south of France. Yeah. You're not alone if you're following that. And I would watch, actually, as hotel companies rush to work with movies and TV shows because they can see it's the best marketing you can imagine. So what's the next big trend for next year? Is that going to continue or is there something else we can look out for? Are you ready to go to space? Oh, interesting. Hmm. I mean, I know you have Maybe. the astronaut. <laughs> so there's a company called Space Perspective, which has much less uh, publicity than, say, SpaceX. Mm -hmm. But it's it's got a essentially a weather balloon with a luxury capsule attached, $125,000 a person, but you'll get a few hours almost in space, no training needed, and they say they're going to start flights by the end of next year. Wow. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I'm into that one. Would you take I mean, no, it's... A weather balloon? Mm. <laughs> No. Didn't that, didn't that didn't sell it no, to you? No, that doesn't okay. pique my interest. But it has champagne and Wi-Fi. Okay, maybe. <laughs> All right, lastly, uh, how is the travel industry looking as a whole for next year? There are some, there are some challenges with supply. I, I talked about the air traffic controllers. There's pilot shortages, and also there are plane shortages. So I would anticipate the issues we had this year rolling over to next year. But remember, first flight of the day, get that flighty app. There are certain things you can do, which mean that when the problems arise, you're not the last person to be helped. Okay, so you can take some control when things do go out of exactly. your control. All right, Mark Elwood, thank you so much. Pleasure. We appreciate your time. And now to a story that will warm your heart. Our friends on the Today Show honored a four-legged therapy dog who works closely with kids with autism. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has been filling in as Santa's helper to bring those kids and the dog some holiday cheer. Sam, good morning. 
Yeah, guys, good morning. Look, we all know the powerful connection with animals. We're about to introduce you. you, though, in our own lives to a six-year-old Labrador retriever. Her name is Eliza. She lives outside of the Atlanta area, and when she shows up at the Autism Therapy Center in her neighborhood, she is doing things right now to help children thrive and succeed in their everyday lives. And when Chewy, the online pet supply store company, reached out to us to talk to us about their campaign with Eliza, we knew that we wanted to do something to make this holiday season perfect. Whether it's a warm hug or a slobbery kiss, when Eliza the therapy dog joins the party, it's joyful chaos. Puppy! Puppy! That's green! That's green too! Everyone wants to say hello to their four legged best friend. As for me, well, I'm kind of just in the way. Hey, bud, how are you doing? <laughs> Welcome to the party. And honestly, who can blame these four and five year olds? Eliza's patience, honorable. As she reports for duty at Hope Ridge Autism Therapy Center in Georgia, just one of many clinics designed to help children nationwide with autism, often in underserved communities. Eliza's job is to assist the kids with activities that teach them life skills, like counting. How many toes does Eliza have? So she's got five toes on her paw. All of it working towards school readiness. We want these kids to be independent. Donna Bryan is Eliza's owner and a former therapist at the clinic. She left to pursue her master's in social work. A lot of these kids are really struggling with communicating their needs. Well, Eliza doesn't need to communicate. You don't have to explain anything to her. She is just right there. She's going to meet you wherever you are. Can you show Eliza your tongue? Yep. <laughs> are you seeing them become more verbal, even without having to communicate with Eliza? Absolutely. Absolutely. We might not necessarily understand exactly what it is that they're saying, but you know what? She does. <laughs> and she's going she's gonna to respond in, in only a way she can. One of those children is four-year-old Annika Gonzalez. In less than a year, she hit a communication milestone. When she was diagnosed with autism, she was considered nonverbal. To be honest, when she was diagnosed, I never thought I would hear her say, Mom, or I love you. But now, Annika can form complete sentences. Her mother, Kimberly, says thanks, in part, to Eliza's helping paw. When she's with Eliza, she feels a sense of security. Mm. She feels happiness and joy. Hi. Hi. Yes. <laughs> I love you. Can I see? Okay. Uh. That kind of progress is something worth celebrating. So in honor of Eliza, anyone want to go to a party? Yeah! yeah let's do it. So Chewy threw you a holiday party. Look at all these presents. Annika, what is this? What is this? Eliza, can I have your help with this, please? And there was one more surprise left in store for our guest of honor. Chewy likes to celebrate deserving animals like Eliza. This year, they would like to donate twenty thousand dollars to Blue Path Service Dogs, but there can be so many more Elizas out there. Wow! Oh my goodness, you guys have no idea the impact this is going to make on so many families. Here's to more Elizas. <laughs> And Valerie, a little bit more background on Eliza. According to Donna, she was actually trained originally as a guide dog, but had a food allergy. So instead, she channeled her inner spirit and all of that beautiful love and became an animal therapy dog instead. Really, really remarkable story there. As long as we're talking about a personal dose of love right now, this buddy right here is Oreo. He's mine. He's only two months old. And if many of you right now are wondering, don't go anywhere, Oreo. If you're wondering at home, like, is my animal potentially uh, qualified to be a therapy dog? There's the sorts of things you'd be looking for, calm, so if they're a bundle of energy, unfortunately that's great at home, but it's not great for therapy, that they love all people and immediately are drawn to them, and they're not easily spooked or unsettled, so I still have hope for this one right here. <laughs> He's fairly unflappable. My other dog at home, very different story, Valerie. I'm sure we can all relate on that one. I think that one there is made for TV. So cute, Sam. <laughs> all right. TV <thanks>. star. <laughs> Adorable. See ya.
We're back now with a blast from the past. Well, the early 2000s, actually. The leading ladies of the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants are back together again, but this time they're trading in their signature denim for Barbie Pink. The former co-stars reunited to celebrate America Ferrera's performance in Barbie at a SAG after screening right here in New York. Ferrara, Blake Lively, Alexis Bledel, and Amber Tamlin all posed for pictures nearly two decades after the first of their two films hit the theaters and stole many of our hearts. It was a moment of pure nostalgia for fans who fell in love with those magical pants, but even without them, the sisterhood still lives on. And Savannah, they were teenagers when they shot those films, so so great to see them coming back together. I know, I love that they are all still such good friends and they look fabulous, and she was so good in that movie. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Valerie. Well, finally, this hour, if you watch the Jacksonville Jaguars take on the Baltimore Ravens yesterday, you'll have seen well-known Ravens players like Lamar Jackson, Odell Beckham Jr., but there's one person you might not have seen, the chaplain. Every team in the league has one, and I had the chance to spend some time with the Baltimore Ravens chaplain, a beloved member of that team who is just as important as the players on the field. For many, Sundays are a day dedicated to football and to faith. And this is not for them, Lord, it is for your glory. But few people combine the two more fully than Johnny Shelton, team chaplain for the Baltimore Ravens. We're leaning on you, Lord. A spiritual guide on the sidelines of every game, like Sunday night in Jacksonville against the Jaguars. Do most people know that this is a part of an NFL team? Most people don't know, which is a good thing for us is that you stay out of the way. Well, today's your moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's God's moment. <laughs> yeah. All 32 NFL teams have a chaplain, but the Ravens say they are one of a handful that have theirs in-house full-time. The blessing is being able to be in the building full-time. Things that just come up where people need to talk or they want advice. Johnny has been with the team for a decade, in addition to scheduled Bible studies for different groups, like coaches, players, and even their significant others. Johnny's door is always open for counseling. What are the types of things that the players come to you about? They come to me with football pressure, family pressure, relationship issues. Life is hard enough. And at the flip side of that, football is hard enough. So when you put those two together, it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Johnny makes it easy for players to seek him out when they need him, doing a prayer walk around the training fields at the start of every practice. I pray for, for the safety, for their minds, their hearts to be clear, to be able to focus um, on the task at hand. And, and they will literally come up and some of them mm. will ask for prayer personally. And so it's a, it's a right special time. Right here on time. the field. Yeah. Yeah, right here as we as we're going going as I'm coming around. The same is true on game day when Johnny will pray with players individually on the sidelines and collectively as a team in the locker room. So right before we go out to take the field, the last thing we do is we pray as a, as a team. Johnny's message resonates with players of faith like three-time Pro Bowl defensive back Marlon Humphrey. Football comes up occasionally, but it's it's mainly just life, different things going on, relationship. Even sometimes when it is football, it's it's more so just how can you be more of a leadership role? As well as with former player and current assistant coach Anthony Weaver. We're football coaches, we're football players. We assume we're alphas, right? Mm -hmm. We can we can solve and we can figure out everything. And you it's not natural to turn to somebody for help and for guidance. He makes that easy. You mentioned some of the players that aren't Christians. Is your door open to all faiths, all beliefs? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to love all. We're not going to disciple everybody. So whatever their faith is, we're, we're here to love them. That's what Jesus did. The influence of a chaplain is felt throughout the NFL. Once a month, the chaplains across the league have a Zoom call together. Those are my guys. I know them very well. We're able to lean on. We're, we talk with each other. The league chaplains also shepherd one of game day's more touching traditions, a post-game prayer circle formed by members of both teams. The chaplains call it, meet me at the 50. We will pray together, just thanking God for to be able to have this competition to play this great game of football. 
by the way, Baltimore beat Jacksonville 23 to 7. They are now 11 and 3 this season. They are our team, by the way. We're going on New Year's Eve. It's my husband. He's from Maryland. <laughs> so we're very excited. And also, Chaplain Johnny says his door is open to all faiths, which is very cool. He has all different types of people who come and see him, and he loves his job. What a great job. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's awesome. That does it for Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.